Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Emily Sue. And I'm Edna Adair. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Student protest leaders plan to meet mainland officials foiled after being denied on Beijing flight. End of the road for Occupy protesters after losing appeal against injunctions. Barack Obama warns of Asia intimidation and failed threat to China. A trip to Beijing by student protest leaders to meet mainland officials was cut short today when they weren't even allowed to get on the plane. The Federation of Students learned that their home return permits had been cancelled at the 11th hour. There was a sea of yellow umbrellas at the airport this afternoon when student leaders behind the Occupy protests arrived as they aimed to take their call for greater democracy on a 5 p.m. flight to Beijing. Supporters of the Federation of Students chanted slogans and sang songs to wish them success in their bid to meet Premier Li Keqiang to discuss the city's political reform. Opponents of the students and their mass sit-in, now in its 49th day, were also there but not so welcoming. Led by pro-Beijing hardliner Patrick Ko, who heads the group Voice of Loving Hong Kong, they labeled the student activists as shameful. A shouting match broke out between the two sides. Airport security and police officers had to cordon off the area and stop people in and out of the zone. This woman got emotional and accused the police of only protecting the pro-Beijing protesters and not the students' supporters. Before setting off, the Federation's Secretary General Alex Chow, along with leading members Eason Chung and Nathan Law, said they were heading to the capital to reflect Hong Kong people's wishes for genuine universal suffrage and a way out of the current political stalemate. Of course, we would say, well, uh, dialogue is important uh, for well, resolving the current dispute. But it depends on whether Beijing has the initiative uh, to uh, 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 open dialogue uh, with students. Chao remains defiant, although many have warned them they're wasting their time. Nothing could uh, defeat Hong Kong people because uh, Hong Kong people have been uh, uh, pursuing democracy or democratic reform for uh, more than uh, three decades. And, and we are still on our way to, well, uh, um, uh, 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 to restructure the mechanism of uh, uh, democracy. But as some had speculated, their journey was short-lived and they didn't even make it past the check-in counters. The airline told the trio that their home return permits are no longer valid. Their um, like return home card uh, cancelled by the mainland authority, so they could not get the uh, required uh, certificates to uh, get, into the, uh, get onto the planes. The Federation said they have to consult different groups first before briefing reporters on their next step. The students' road to Beijing was a bumpy one. Their initial plan was to gate-crash the APEC summit to meet state leaders in charge of Hong Kong affairs, but they abandoned it. Then they turned to local loyalist heavyweights, hoping they would be their go-betweens with senior officials. But their requests were rejected by everyone they approached, including former chief executive Tong Chi Hua. Both Chief Executive Leung Chenying and its number two Carrie Lam described their trip as unnecessary, as Beijing already knows what they want to say. The Federation also wrote an open letter to Lee before setting off this afternoon, inviting the Premier to come to Hong Kong and hear directly from the protesters their call for greater democracy. Protesters appealing against injunctions for Hong Kong have lost their case again and admitted it seems futile. The judges say they simply can't see the defendants winning their appeal. Winner Wang reports. The Court of Appeal has rejected the bid by protesters to appeal against a three-week-ago injunction demanding they leave Hong Kong streets. It's just one of two court battles instigated by representatives from two taxi driver associations and a minibus company last month. They want protesters occupying Nathan Road between Argyle and Dundas Streets and Argyle Street between Portland and Tong Choi Streets to leave because they're seriously affecting their businesses. As a result, the High Court issued the injunctions. Protesters tried to appeal the one for Nathan Road, but failed. Not wanting to give up, the defendants appealed again, this time for the right to appeal. But in today's judgment, High Court Judge Andrew Cheung and Court of Appeal Vice President Johnson Lam explained that they didn't see the appeal as having any reasonable prospect of success. 
They disagreed with the defendant's lawyer that the drivers could not prove any particular direct and substantial losses due to the street occupations. I'm not disappointed uh, to the uh, uh, legal institutions or uh, 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 or I mean um, the, the court or the judge. I'm not disappointed at them. I'm disappointed to Hong Kong government because throughout the whole legal proceedings and also throughout these 50 days. Hong Kong SAR government do not respond to the firm and determined public opinion on how to proceed about the Hong Kong political system should be, and also the universal suffrage, that how it should be implemented. Fox said they would try to see if there's anything else they can do, but admitted it looks like the end of the road as far as legal challenges are concerned. The judges today also changed some words in the original injunction, and the plaintiff's lawyer has promised that in the meantime, they will not take any steps to enforce the order. Separately, the lawyer representing the plaintiff for the other Mongkok injunction said today their next step will be to follow court orders and place relevant legal documents in a conspicuous place for protesters to see. As to the actual execution of the injunction order, I have to take detailed instructions from my client and of course um, to communicate with the bailiff and the police. Today, details of the High Court's injunction for Siddick Tower and Admiralty were also published in Chinese and English in two newspapers. High Court Judge Thomas Au has allowed the police to assist bailiffs in carrying out clearance action and police may arrest protesters if they don't cooperate. The police chief said today that the force will fully support actions taken by the bailiff. For those protesters who chose to defy the law, who chose to ignore the court order, or obstruct the execution of the injunction order, the police will take resolute measure to deal with them in accordance with the law. Zhang called for protesters to stop their illegal behavior and leave the roads. Winna Wong, ATV News. Sunung Kai co-chairman Thomas Kwok has admitted the Occupy protests have affected the, his businesses. Meanwhile, Police Chief Andy Zhang insisted today the arrests of two Occupy protesters last week were not politically motivated. Police relations with the Occupy movement hit a new low on Wednesday after they arrested two protesters who scuffled with opponents of the demonstrations at the Admiralty Base Camp. The demonstrators insisted they were only trying to help officers catch three troublemakers who allegedly threw bags of foul-smelling animal organs at media mogul Jimmy Lai. In the end, the protesters were detained for common assault and fighting in a public place and later released on bail. Pro-democracy demonstrators on Thursday marched to police headquarters in Central, demanding an apology over the arrests and for the charges to be dropped, claiming the arrests were politically motivated. Police Chief Annie Tsang today brushed aside such allegations, insisting that all officers carry out their duties impartially. Zhang told protesters to contact the police as soon as possible if anyone starts causing trouble and advised those who wish to stop them to consider several factors before taking any action. They must think about their personal safety, see if they're using an appropriate amount of force against their opponents and if they could have to be held accountable afterwards, said Zhang. The police chief added it's impossible for the police to make everyone happy over their actions. In a related development, members of the Radical League of Social Democrats carrying yellow umbrellas arrived outside property giant Sun Hongkai's headquarters in Wan Chai this afternoon. They wanted to draw attention on the city's widening wealth gap after tycoon brothers Thomas and Raymond Kwok waded into the debate about the Occupy protests. Sun Hongkai co-chairman Thomas said the street seizures have had a minimal impact on their hotels and catering businesses so far. But he said things could get worse if they continue, adding that advanced bookings for both rooms and wedding venues in future months are noticeably worse than last year. The group's Ritz-Carlton Hotel in West Kowloon has lost 10 percent of its business since the demonstration started in late September. The Tycoon brothers are currently on trial in the biggest corruption case the city has ever seen for allegedly bribing former government number two, Rafael Hoy. World leaders are in Australia for the G20 summit, and topping the agenda is the situation in Ukraine. At the same time, U.S. President Barack Obama issued a veiled warning to China not to bully Asia. Arthur Kaoda reports. 
Speaking at Queensland University in Brisbane on the first day of the two-day G20 summit, U.S. President Barack Obama reaffirmed the West's commitment to helping its Asian allies. That included a veiled warning to China over its territorial disputes with other countries. We believe that nations and peoples have the right to live in security and peace. That an effective security order for Asia must be based not on spheres of influence or coercion or intimidation where big nations bully the small, but on alliances of mutual security, international law, international norms that are upheld, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. The U.S. president wasn't so vague in criticizing Russia, labeling it as a threat alongside Ebola and Islamic State, and openly accusing Moscow of shooting down a Malaysia Airlines jet in July over eastern Ukraine, killing nearly 300 people. As the world's only superpower, the United States has unique responsibilities that we gladly embrace. We're leading the international community in the fight to destroy the terrorist group ISIL. We're leading in dealing with Ebola in West Africa and in opposing Russia's aggression against Ukraine, which is a threat to the world, as we saw in the appalling shootdown of MH17. At the same time, Russian television has broadcast leaked images from a British or American satellite that appear to show the plane being shot down by a fighter jet, possibly a Ukrainian warplane. The situation in Ukraine has become a focal point of the meeting, with Russia facing further sanctions after the West accused Moscow of sending weapons and troops into the country. They should sit down together to address all this issue harmoniously, peacefully, through dialogue. The continuing conflict and tensions and violence in that uh, uh, southeastern area of um, uh, Ukraine is not helpful at all. Uh, for not only world peace and security, uh, but world economy. Uh, this has uh, global implications in all aspects. Therefore, uh, I urge leaders, particularly uh, the United States and European and Russian leaders who are get, uh, set, uh, sitting together in G20, uh, they also discussed this matter on the margins of these uh, G20 meetings. While the talks are supposed to be aimed at covering global economic growth, not global security, European leaders are set to meet with Obama this weekend to discuss more diplomatic action to handle the matter. But I want to restate that the European Union continues to believe that it can only be a political solution to the crisis. We will continue to use all diplomatic tools, including sanctions, at our disposal. The EU foreign ministers will on Monday assess the situation on the ground and discuss possible further steps. At the start of the summit meeting, Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott called on leaders to work together towards solutions to the world's problems. As you look around the world, there are many difficulties and problems. There are problems in the Middle East, uh, there are problems in Eastern Europe, uh, there are terrible problems in West Africa. Uh, growth has been fragile. But the message that should come from us over these next two days is a message of hope and optimism. In between all the tough talk, International Monetary Fund Chief Christine Lagarde took some time out for an unusual one-on-one -on -one meeting on the sidelines of the summit with a two-year-old koala. Oh, sweet little baby. All right, I'm taking it home. No, it's a pity I have to go to a bilateral meeting now. <laughs> But Lagarde wasn't the only one who got familiar with the local wildlife, as the wives of the leaders paid a visit to Brisbane's Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. Arthur Urquiola, ATV News. Financial Services Secretary Chen Kakon says Monday's start of the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect should go smoothly. However, he admitted there could be some market volatility. And Jang reports. With the launch of the highly anticipated Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect in just three days, Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury Chen Ka Kung said today that the central government assessed many factors before giving the green light, and everything is going according to plan. In response to the mainland's announcement just yesterday after stock markets closed that foreign investors buying A shares via the scheme will be exempt from paying capital gains tax, Chan said the timing was appropriate because it's a very sensitive issue. 
Chan isn't ruling out market volatility during the new scheme because there are a lot of mainland investors trading Hong Kong stocks and they can bypass mainland restrictions to day trade. Nevertheless, Chan insisted the SAR's markets will remain balanced as the Stock Connect has a daily trade ceiling and requires a minimum investment of $500,000, which weeds out small investors. Chan said the Securities and Futures Commission and the China Securities Regulatory Commission spent a lot of time and effort working out the rules, so information exchanges between the two should be smooth. He added that the scheme is a major step in opening up the mainland's capital accounts and can also help stimulate Hong Kong's trade volume. With the Occupy movement still paralyzing parts of the city, Chan warned that the financial market is very sensitive to concerns about the city's political and judicial systems being compromised, and many overseas investors are considering moving their businesses out of Hong Kong. He also accused Occupy protesters of being naive in thinking that civil disobedience doesn't violate the rule of law and it is not a reason to take over public spaces. An Chang, ATV News. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam has called on lawmakers to hurry up and pass funding proposals that will help the city's poorest people. She urged them to stop their delay tactics as people's lives are being affected. An Chang reports. Due to filibustering before the summer holiday, Lechco's Finance Committee has a backlog of funding proposals, including the introduction of subsidies for low-income families proposed by the Poverty Commission. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam stressed today that addressing poverty is a government priority and criticized Lechco members for stalling the proposal as it has severely affected people's well-being. She said the Poverty Commission has been working hard for the past two years to address poverty and if the subsidy proposal passes, it will benefit more than 700,000 people. Lam hopes Lechco members, especially the pan-Democrats, can be more decisive and pass the motion. She also mentioned that the Poverty Commission's term of office is expiring and Chief Executive Leung Chenying has appointed new members to serve from the beginning of next month to the 30th of June 2017. And Chang, ATV News. Yeah, another fruit scandal is churning stomachs in Taiwan after gypsum powder was used to make tofu. At the same time, tainted coconut oil has been found in food products. Taiwan's Uni President Enterprises Corporation has announced that it might sue Tingxin International Group for supplying it with tainted coconut oil. The oil has been used in 23 products and was imported from a Vietnamese company which reportedly did not have a license to manufacture edible products. The products, including several types of ice cream and puddings, have already been sold or destroyed after passing their expiry date. Investigations are underway after it was discovered that Brothers Farm Foods Company Limited had purchased gypsum powder from Yongchang Gypsum Chemical Company to process tofu. The tofu was immediately removed from shelves. Cooking gypsum powder is used to make tofu solid. Yung Chan was accused of processing industrial gypsum powder as food, and the ingredient was sold to 16 tofu pudding shops. Taipei City Public Health Bureau has confiscated all the inedible products 